Hello and welcome to Social Church. We are delighted to be joined by the brilliant author, Dr. Kevin Van Hooser today to discuss his new book, Hearers and Doers. Welcome to Social Church, Dr. Van Hooser. Thank you for your hospitality. Before we talk about your new book, Hearers and Doers, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a native Californian. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, graduated from school in California, but then I went to Cambridge, England to do my doctoral work. Yeah. Uh, along the way, I uh, met my wife in France during a short mission stint. And so we together lived in Cambridge for several years. And then after my doctorate, uh, we found ourselves in Edinburgh, where I taught at the University of Edinburgh for eight years. Wow, yeah. And then we came back to the States. We have two daughters. I have 15 PhD students. Uh, I've been teaching here in the States since uh, 1998, over 20 years. And I'm committed to working not only with my students uh, and my doctoral students, but also with pastors who appreciate the need for theology to serve the church. I've been active uh, for the past few years in something called the Center for Pastor Theologians. So you're a busy man, then. Uh, busy, <laughs> but you know, I don't feel that I have a job. I just get to do what I enjoy yeah, doing all day long. That's so good, isn't it? That's so good. Tell us about this brilliant new book that you've done. So Hearers and Doers. And how did you come to write it, Kevin? Uh, it started its life as a series of video lectures, believe it or not, <laughs> on the importance of reading the Bible theologically in the church. Uh, the video series was called The Path and Place to Make Disciples. The path was reading scripture, the place was the local church. And to be honest, I, I never intended to write a book, mm. but uh, the people responsible for the video asked me, could I turn it into a book? And then when I looked at, when I looked at it, I thought, I'm going to need to do a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> I ended up revising everything pretty radically, uh, added 50% new material, rearranged everything. In fact, I only decided to focus on wellness, diet, and fitness as an overarching theme after seeing the cover art (laughs) the publisher was proposing, a staircase. And I thought, climbing, and that's exercise, and it's making progress. So everything started, in a sense, from a video lecture and from a picture. Yeah, excellent. So those video lectures, are they available to the public? Uh, well, yes, at a price. It's, it's part of uh, theological education online. Yeah. And they, this particular company is called Faith Life. Okay, yeah. Uh, has a lot of speakers that, um, you know, have given lectures. And I don't, to be honest, I don't know what it costs. But the idea is you can take an online course with video lectures and so on. Ah, brilliant. Well, we'll find out the link for that. And we'll put that in the description below as well, in case any of the listeners okay. are interested. That's brilliant. Very good. So... Why do hearers of the same word become different doers? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I think Jesus had something to say about this in his parable of the sower yeah. in Matthew 13. Uh, he, he, tells, he talks about the word of God being sown. And the reason, hearer, some, the reason hearers become different kinds of doers is that the seed falls on different kinds of ground. That is, the hearts of people uh, are not the same. Uh, Some people are very excited initially and enthusiastic about hearing the Word of God, but then after a while they lose their passion. And so it's like a seed sown on rocky ground there. It may take for a bit, but then the plant withers. And then other seeds get crowded out by invasive species, among which I think we'd have to include social media. And uh, as I explain in the book, it isn't enough simply to hear the Word or even to study it. I tell my students this. It's not. Don't think that just because you've studied the word, you've responded to it the right way. This is a word that wants to be eaten, that mm-hmm. wants to be ingested, digested. It wants to get into us, and it also calls for a response. We have to walk differently if we're following this word. That's what a disciple is. It means that a follower of a word. So it's not enough to hear. We have to do... And it's not even about being a good person either. Uh, This is uh, sometimes a misconception about disciples. Mm -hmm. Jesus isn't calling us simply to be moral people. He wants us to trust him with our lives. And yes, right behavior is important, but following Jesus involves much more than being moral. It means 
laying hold of the promises of God that have been fulfilled in his person and work. Mm, that's good. You've made the case before for pastors to become public theologians. Tell us a little bit about that. So Jesus, uh, remember that episode when he was a small boy, he wandered off and his parents wondered where he was yeah. and they find him in the temple. And Jesus was surprised that they didn't know where he was. And he said, didn't you know that I would be busy with my at my father's house or in my father's business? Or I think another translation would be, didn't you know I'd be busy or about the things of my father? Mm. And I think this is what pastors are about. They're about the things of our father, what the father is doing. So what is he doing? I believe God is forming a holy nation, uh, as he did with Israel, so with the church. He is interested in forming a people that will be a set-apart people, a witnessing people, a vanguard of a new creation. And so theology means having to do with God. Public means having to do with people. Mm. And so pastors, pastors do theology working with people to help form people into this holy nation to help hearers become doers to help people individuals and communities to live into the truth of the gospel and then to live it out mm. and, and that by the way is what pastors do that no other professional yeah. does <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know um, <laughs> pastors may not think they have the skills of an airplane pilot or a surgeon but pastors are, are called to do something very specific. They're called to minister the gospel, and they work with people, which is always hard. I'm a theologian, and it's easier to work with books, because books um, just cooperate more. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, pastors, pastors help people to get right with God in Christ, and that's what I mean by public theology. Yeah, that's good. I've heard you say before that sola scriptura can encourage interpretive pride. Tell us how and what can we do to fight against that? Um, well, here in the States, we have a, a well-known saying from President Harry Truman, the buck stops here. Mm -hmm. And that means authority. The ultimate say-so belongs to the president. But for Christians... The ultimate say-so is God's. God has ultimate authority, and God has said so in the Bible. So it's tempting to read the Bible in ways that support our personal positions. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, I have a high view of biblical authority, but it's important to make sure the authority is with Scripture and not simply with my interpretation. Yeah. So I actually think that sola scriptura, the Re Reformation cry, scripture alone, I actually think that that can serve as a check on interpretive pride, because if we really believe it, we're saying scripture itself, not our interpretation of it necessarily, mm -hmm. is the supreme authority for faith and life. So I'm a, I'm a Reformed Protestant. I believe that the Church and myself must always be being reformed according to God's word written because uh, we're not there yet yeah. and we can't simply equate our reading with with what the text is saying we can be confident but not presumptuous yeah yeah that's good you've quoted a source in the book stating that 87 percent of churchgoers have said that what they need most from their church is help understanding the bible what practical things can a church be doing to help meet those needs uh, that's a great question. You know, I think, especially at the Reformation, um, the the Reformers, the early Protestants, wanted to get the Bible into the hands of everyday people. Mm -hmm. And that's why Luther, for example, worked so hard translating the Bible into everyday German. He wanted people to get to read it. So literacy is all about knowing how to read texts. Uh, the first thing you've got to be able to do is read the text. So that's why we, we care about getting Bibles in the everyday language into people's hands. But uh, it's not just, you know, reading is, is kind of complicated because we don't want them simply to pronounce the words. We want them to understand. Yeah. So I, I actually think one of the best ways to learn to understand and read the Bible 
is to have access to good preaching. Mm -hmm. uh, preachers should be sure to explain what the text is saying. And they should be sure to say that the text they're explaining, the particular passages they're speaking on, is part of a bigger text, is, is part of the canon, part of the bigger unified story of Scripture. Mm -hmm. and, and one way to read the Bible well is to be able to place the parts of Scripture into the bigger story. Mm -hmm. And they should also, in a sermon, uh, say something about the context of the Bible, not not simply the historical context, although that helps to to know why it was written, to whom, and under what circumstances, but also the canonical context, and also the the place of this text in the larger history of redemption, the redemptive historical context, as it were. This is something a sermon should do. And then third, I think pastors should help their congregations understand that there are different kinds of literature in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So when you're preaching, make it clear. Is it is it from the law? Is it a song? Is it prophecy, narrative, apocalyptic? What kind of literary genre are we preaching? And I think that this is why, by the way, preachers need to be trained um, in how to read Scripture. They're modeling it every time they preach. Mm -hmm. And I'm also struck by the fact that uh, John Calvin wrote his famous Institutes, which is a book of theology, but he, he wrote it, he says in the preface, in order to help people understand the faith, what it's all about, so that they would know what the Bible is talking about when they read. Yeah. So a little theology doesn't hurt either. Yeah, that's good. You've written before about the power in preaching Christ from the Old Testament. Tell, tell us a little bit about that and, and, you know, the best way of doing it and the success you've seen. Uh, right. Well, so when Jesus was alive, the only Bible there was was what we now call the Old Testament. It was yeah. the scriptures of Israel. And so when we read in the New Testament that Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, we have to understand he was always teaching from the Old Testament. Yeah. I think that's significant. Yeah. Somehow he was able to teach from the Old Testament about himself, mm -hmm. about who he was and and his, the significance of his work. Now, I'm not suggesting that Christians allegorize every detail in the Old Testament, but as I was saying earlier, we, we should realize that the Old Testament has, a, has an arc. That is, it's, it's an unfinished book. Everything is pointing forward. To read the Old Testament as Christians, we have to be able to follow the plot, the plot of yeah. its story, the, the arc of redemptive history, and it, and it comes to completion in Jesus. Um, so when we're reading the Old Testament, we have to be thinking, how does Jesus continue or complete this story? And the New Testament clearly shows that Jesus is the second Adam. He's the one greater than Moses. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a greater prophet. He's a greater priest. He's a greater king. Um, and more importantly, we, we see his saving work, his death on the cross, in terms of his being both the high priest and the sacrificial lamb. Yeah. So I, I'm saying we, we really don't understand who Jesus is or what he was up to apart from the Old Testament. And so we need to read Jesus in light of the Old Testament and the Old Testament in light of Jesus. Mm. God's word is powerful and God is sovereign and he can do as he likes. So why do we need the church? Uh, I agree with what you said. Uh, he, God is sovereign. And what and he has done what he's like. Uh, he he has found it proper. He's liked to to found a church. <laughs> I think in his mercy and in his wisdom, he's ordained a place, the local church, mm. that serves his end. And the local church exists in order to proclaim, teach, celebrate, meditate on, and perform his word. Mm. Um, and if I can go back to Calvin, I think he has a good answer to your question. He says the church exists because believers, everyday Christians, need outward helps. So Calvin calls the church a means of grace. Yeah. And it's a God-appointed means by which God invites us into the society of Christ, keeps us in that society, 
and matures us unto Christ's likeness. Mm. And that's, that's the, the answer to what the church does for the believer. But in addition to being gathered together by God's word uh, in order to be conformed to it, the church exists also as a witness to the world to be salt and light. Yeah. Um, this is a, it's a powerful witness. When people from different ethnic backgrounds and social classes gather together, forgive one another, pass the peace, enjoy communion around the Lord's table, yeah. when they do those things, a local church becomes a parable of the kingdom. Yeah. It's yeah. A, a living demonstration of the reconciliation that, that does exist in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We need the church for the same reason we need ministers, yeah. to minister the word and, and to embody the reconciliation the word announces. Yeah, that's so true. In Hearers and Doers, you speak about church as the theatrical church. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, in another book, and in fact two other books, I've um, used the theatrical analogy to talk about theology and the church. Uh, to very briefly, I think it's appropriate because the gospel is something is something God says and something God does mm -hmm. on the stage, as it were, of world history. So there's something very dramatic about Christianity. It's not simply a system of ideas. It's not a philosophy. It's not a more. It's not a more. It's not a system of morality. It's an announcement that God has said and done something in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's dramatic. And I was uh, struck by the fact that uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 4 9 says that he and the other apostles have become a spectacle to the world. And the Greek term spectacle there is theatron. He's, a, he says he, he's saying that the Christians have become a theater to the world. Mm -hmm. And a theater is, is a very interesting metaphor. A theater is a place where action takes place. But it also refers to the people doing the action. And I think this is what a church is. The church, the people, are where the action takes place. It's, that is, is where lives are transformed, where communities are formed um, to live out the truth of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by church as theater. It, it's not a place to play act. <laughs> it's not a place to perform to get applause. Yeah. It's a community that lives out the story of Jesus Christ. That's why I, I think of the church as theatrical. Yeah, that's good. We live in a generation where many of the fastest growing Western megachurches are elevating emotion and personal experience over the word of God. What's your take on this, Kevin? Uh, well, yes, I, I, and I live in a country where this happens a lot. Mm -hmm. um, my concern is that it's hard to maintain an emotional high. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, I, I know that people can get worked up to an emotional high, but um, the Christian life is, is, I think, yes, it has ups and downs, and there are peaks, but there are also valleys. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the Christian life is a walk not always a mountaintop experience. It's a pilgrimage. This is why John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim was not always on a high. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's also a strong call for endurance. And that doesn't sound like, you know, a high emotional experience. It sounds harder. And <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> I'm also concerned about churches that go for mountaintop experiences because I read a book a few years ago mm. entitled The Experience Economy. The authors were, uh, I think, taught at a business school and they're arguing that what sells today are not simply raw materials, not even the products that we make from raw materials. No, they say what sells today is experience. Mm. And so you have people having to do more and more um, kind of extreme things to feel as though they've had an experience, right? It's yeah. not enough to get married today. You have to have a, a destination wedding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you have to be married at the, I don't know, the edge of a volcano or something. <laughs> as if marriage weren't exciting enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess the risk with that as well, when we, we, you know, again, we see it as part of our, the way the next generation is doing church almost is there'll be this emotional worship and then there'll be an altar call 
and you, you see a lot of people go forward and they're told from an authority figure at the front that they've made a decision and they're now going to be, you know, saved with no check-in and, and, and you know, this is a response to a, a, a motion and there are people walking out and around with a, with a sense of salvation when really they're not saved. Um, yes. And the other, the other problem is that there are counterfeit emotional highs. Yeah. You know, you can get a spiritual high from a pharmaceutical product, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, so we don't live simply for those highs. Yeah. Um, so there's lots, of, there's lots of things to watch out for. I, but on the other hand, you know, I, I think we should have um, – the emotions are involved just as every part of our being is involved in becoming a Christian. There is a rightness – to delighting in the Lord and mm-hmm. to delighting in the gospel and to delighting in his law as the psalmist does in yeah. Psalm 1. But this delight, I have a feeling, is more of a settled disposition, yeah. not a, a, you know, a temporary emotion. Yeah. If we truly believe that the church is one, what should this unity look like? Uh, this is a hard question. Uh, I do believe the church is one. Um, and, you know, we just celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, yeah. and many commentators were saying it doesn't look like one. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I read the figure somewhere that there are over 30,000 denominations. Mm. But uh, I, don't think, I don't think unity has to be institutional. Um, that is, I'm not looking for one single organization. I don't think that's what we have to look for when we talk about the unity of the church. The church is one already in Christ, but it's not an organizational or institutional unity. Mm. So that means its unity must be different than institutional. Mm. Uh, Having said that, I do think the church is one in Christ, and I do think different churches at local and denominational levels should do more to display that unity. It doesn't have to be an institutional expression, but there should be an expression of Christian fellowship. So, for example, those who can share the Lord's table with those from other churches should do so on occasion. Um, And those who feel that for various reasons you can't do that should find other ways to express fellowship or agreement. For example, for years now, I've been a member of something called Evangelicals and Catholics Together. Now, the idea is that in an increasingly secular age, it's good to let the world know that Evangelical Protestants and Roman Catholics can agree on a number of important issues, Mm -hmm. some theological some social, for example, Christian marriage. Mm. Uh, for, for many years, uh, Jim Packer was on that committee too, and he felt it was one of the most important things he was doing in his, you know, the later chapter of his life, mm. working towards this. Now, again, we aren't working for institutional unity here. It's more of a strategic show. It's a witness um, display of fe- a deep fellowship over the essentials, uh, even though we acknowledge there are things that sadly separate our communions. Yeah. In pursuing that unity, how do we avoid calling wolves sheep and potentially signposting believers to heresy? Yeah, that's a great follow up question. Um, so, even in this evangelical Roman Catholics together project, mm-hmm. we never gloss over our differences. Mm-hmm. We're, we're always trying to find. Uh, a common mind, but we're always honest where we can't. But even where we can't, we we still want to remember that there are essentials that we agree on. Um, So the other way to uh, avoid calling wolves sheep is we have to remember, well, we have to remember what a pastor does. One of the images for pastors is shepherd. Yeah. And if we remember our lessons from the Old Testament about the shepherd boy David, well, that's one of the things the shepherd does. A shepherd looks out for any threats to the flock. Mm. And I, I do believe that one of the tasks of pastors today is to help people discern who and what the wolves are. And I think this isn't the most pleasant task of theology, but one of the tasks of theology is to call out idolatry. Yeah. Um, 
Paul talks about doctrines of demons in 1 Timothy 4. We don't want our congregations to be following doctrines of demons. That's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Those are That's wolves. And so I think pastors need to remember that shepherding isn't always a, you know, pleasant, I'm lying in a field kind of activity. Yeah. It often involves fighting off wolves and lions. Mm. What are the hills to die on when seeking unity? I mean, what, what are we talking about here in terms of the non-negotiables? Yes, well, this, this is a tough question. And, um, you know, this is where the church needs wisdom and maturity and patience and grace. Uh, sometimes some people seem to think that every difference has to lead to a division. Yeah. And I think it takes maturity in the faith to realize that you don't need to divide churches over every difference. Mm. On the, at the same time, I think there are things to divide over. Um, and so I think that's what you're asking me. What are the non-negotiables? Yeah. And I would say the non-negotiables are those truths that support and establish the gospel. That is, if we lost those truths, we wouldn't have the gospel. And if we look at church history, we, we, quick, we see that the church quickly discovered what those were. For example, in the early centuries, people wondered, do we have to say Jesus is God? That's very hard mm -hmm. to understand because there's one God, and God the Father is the one God. So how can Jesus be God? You know, do we have to go there? It would be so much easier if we didn't. And so in the early church, you had a group called the Arians, who were saying Jesus wasn't God in the flesh. He was, he was God's best and highest creature. Yeah. And thanks to some very discerning theologians, Athanasius stands out in particular, uh, we realized that if you say Jesus is a creature, the logic of the gospel breaks down. Yeah. His death just becomes a tragedy. There's nothing saving about it. How can a creature... How can a creature's death save us? It yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I think that the non-negotiables are those truths without which we cannot proclaim the gospel with integrity. Mm. So I, I think baptism is extremely important, but I'm not, I don't think the mode of baptism is of the same uh, stature or status as, you know, the divinity of Jesus. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? Yes. So these are salvation affecting issues, right? Yeah. I, I, I think of a heresy as a truth that subverts the logic of the gospel. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And and uh, not every not not every doctrinal difference does that, but some do. And so we have to be alert and we have to be discerning. Yeah, that's good. That's really helpful. Thank you. What what role does theology play in making disciples, Kevin? Again, thank you for that question, because I'm a theologian, and I teach at a <laughs> seminary, and sometimes I get students who are in my classes because they have to be, and they really want to learn how to preach or to counsel, to do something practical and helpful, mm. but they have to take theology. So <laughs> the burden of proof is often on me that theology actually plays a practical role. Yeah. So I, I see theology as a ministry of the church before it is an academic discipline. Um, now, some people minister uh, with, with food. You know, the apostles in Acts 6, the, they distributed food, and you could say that was a kind of ministry. Uh, and I, as a theologian, hand out not sandwiches, but, but understanding. <laughs> At least that's yeah. my goal. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I minister understanding, and by understanding I mean grasping the big picture in which things begin to make sense, you know, uh, and to have understanding, to be oriented, is this is really a blessing, because when you understand your Christian faith, you know how to go on. You have a, a better sense of which steps lead in the right direction. Yeah. So I see theology as making disciples. Because it ministers understanding about God, the world, and ourselves, about the Bible, and about the gospel. Mm. Uh, when we when we learn theology, we understand um, how the news that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, 
informs everything we do. True. I mean, everybody is a theologian, whether or not they realise it or not, right? I mean, everybody's got a sense of a theology that they they hold to in terms of their understanding. Everybody, yes, yes, I think you're right. Everybody has some idea of God. Um, I learned this very quickly in my University of Edinburgh Theology mm-hmm. 1 class, where uh, I remember a student led off the, the, the discussion part of the course by saying, God to me is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's a very subjective way of saying it. But, yeah. but you know, is, can, can we speak about the reality of God? And if so, how? But, but everybody has opinions. The yeah. question is, how do you get from opinion to knowledge? Yeah, that's good. That's really good. What makes Christian discipleship so challenging? Well, uh, so in, in writing this book, Hearers and Doers, I, I saw, I think I saw, that uh, lots of people are trying to make disciples. So one of the things that makes discipleship so challenging is we're, we live in a plurality of discipleships. That is, I think a lot of people are trying to get you to follow their words. Maybe not Jesus' words, but there are lots of words that people are trying to get you to follow. Yeah. Uh, people are trying to sell you something, and so they use words to market their products. And if you hear enough of these words and you hear so many promises salvation this way come on in yeah. you know then the challenge is you begin to get cynical right no one is really going to save you they're just all in it for themselves but i think the biggest problem these days is that um you know spiritual formation is happening all the time it's just we don't know it we're being formed into followers I, I strongly believe that culture, society, are trying to form us into particular kind of citizens. Um, you know, say consumers, uh, people who want to consume culture and buy things. Yeah. Uh, and so we're always being formed. So we're always being discipled. The question is, by whose words? Mm-hmm. And so that's why Christian discipleship is so challenging. Everybody else is trying to disciple us. Yeah. And I think becoming a disciple is a matter of following one set of words and becoming formed in, you know, being a citizen in heaven. If we're Christian disciples, we're being formed into uh, having a citizenship in heaven. But other forms of words train us to be citizens of this worldly kingdoms but we're all followers of some set of words and so that's why it's hard we live in a pluralistic age one of the ways we have been told by jesus to be doers of the word is to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him what what does this look like for the typical christian in the western world today to deny oneself yes well i think uh one of the problems today i think is that Christians, among others, think that God is there for them. We have a sense of entitlement. We're the heroes of our own life stories, and when he needs to be, God can be part of our story. He gets a bit part. He he gets a walk-on appearance, you know, when necessary. But I think denying yourself, dying to yourself, is to heed Jesus' call to change the picture altogether, to see ourselves as the bit players we're we're real actors but we have the small part the reversal is to see that life is god's story we're in god's story he's not in ours Mm. and the thing is this is more exciting it's more exciting to to be in god's story yeah and just one example of this to so that it's not simply abstract um think about our the work we do you know during the week there's nothing wrong with feeling called to do a particular kind of work and wanting to do it well. I think I have that that call. Mm-hmm. God made us to be workers, you know, to keep and till the garden yeah. and to have satisfaction in doing that. But here's the problem. I think many people today uh, are tempted to make a god of their career. Mm-hmm. And they'll do anything to advance their career. They, maybe they'll even sacrifice their children. Yeah. Not literally course but yeah, yeah. metaphorically it's just <laughs> yeah. as bad yeah and the problem with pursuing a career is that again it's all about you it's about making your name great it's it's living your story mm. so to deny yourself to take up your cross is to decide that the work you do should not be to advance your own name it's not for your own career the work you do 
should have something to do with magnifying God's name. You can include hearers and doers by asking the reader what is the gospel. Take us through that section and remind us afresh why there is no greater news, Kevin. Well, the word gospel uh, means good news. And if we think about that, um, there's at least two parts we have to explain. News and what makes it good. Yeah. And yeah, so the fact that there is something good to report is true only because God has done something. And again, this is this is the heart of Christianity. It's not a philosophy of life. It's not a moral system. Christianity is the announcement that God has done something in Jesus Christ yeah. that's newsworthy. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's good. It's it, there it's it's not bad news, it's good news. And it's news also because we have reports about it. Mm -hmm. That's what the Gospels are. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are reports yeah. of what has happened. Big news. and In fact, we can call it breaking news because it's actually, literally, as it were, about God's kingdom breaking into our world in the life and work of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So the Gospel is... Not that it just happened back then, but that God's kingdom, his rule, his way continues to break into our world yeah. one convert at a time. Yeah. And so that's good news, too. It's not just for people in the past. It's the news that even people today can be sons and daughters of the living God because of what has happened in the past. But... In the present, God is still breaking in. There's breaking news today. God is still renewing all of creation in and through Christ by his spirit. And so the gospel is really the best thing that can be heard because we still live in a world that desperately needs some, some new energy in it because we're not there yet. We haven't reached a state where there's justice, where there's peace, and where there's reconciliation. But... The gospel is the news that these things are indeed possible and are becoming real in the church, which is Christ's body, uh, his holy nation, uh, made up of citizens of this gospel. That's brilliant, Kevin. Really good stuff. Dr. Van Hooser, have you got any, are you working on any other projects at the moment? Anything exciting you can talk to us about? Well, it's all exciting. There's some smaller articles, but uh, the book project I'm working on now is a book on how to read the Bible. Yeah and how to read the Bible as a Christian. Great. And I'll just give you the title as a teaser, because it's yeah. not yet ready for public unveiling, but the book title is called Mere Hermeneutics. Brilliant. And when will that be out? Oh, I'm hoping in about a year. Okay, fantastic. Dr. Van Hooser, congratulations on writing Hearers and Doers. It's such a great book, and thank you not only for this book, but for all of the work that you do as well. You're, you're, a, you're a brilliant encouragement to so many people, and we're really grateful for you. Well, thank you for those kind words. And let me just say it's been wonderful to be back in Britain. Yeah. <laughs> you said Britain very well there, Kevin. We can tell you've been living here. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I'm afraid my... I'm afraid my accent has worn off. I'm back to sounding like a Californian. <laughs> thank you so much for your time, Dr. Van Hooser. It's been a pleasure. God bless. Thank you. God bless.